I'm customer relationship manager at PTFS Europe and as Jonathan has, has mentioned earlier, you know, I've been heavily involved with some of the implementations that we've been running this year. Um, so I've only got 20 minutes or even less now if we're a wee bit ahead, um, a wee bit behind in time. So as I'm sure you can appreciate, I can barely scratch the surface with, with, with that demonstration for Koha. So I've worked with Lucy to um, establish what we'll show. So I'll kind of back on to what she has done and show you the staff side of the request and so on. Um, but essentially, before I get to that bit, I just want to, to give you a little bit of an overview as to how easy Koha is to maintain. It's very lightweight. And I'm going to start by showing you some benefits of, of the web-based LMS. Going to look um, at the administration area, and then I'll pick up on the bits that Lucy talked about as well. Okay, now as Jonathan mentioned a few moments ago, Koha is completely web-based and uses responsive technology. So the staff client can also be used just on your mobile phone or, or anything. So it makes it an ideal solution for all devices. So firstly, you have to log in to the staff interface. So you must be a valid member of, of library staff with a username and a password. And if you're a multi-site system, you can select which library you're working at for, for that day. Benefits of, of doing that is that then all the transactions are stored against the correct library. Now, when you log in as well, your login record is associated with a set of permissions and those permissions dictate what access you have into the system. So I've logged in um, as an administrator so I can see everything, including things like the Koha administration panel here. But it may be that your systems team just want to control the administration and not give everybody access to that area. So that would be defined within the login permissions. And then, you know, the appearance of the screen would reflect that. So you maybe wouldn't see, for example, the admin button or the acquisitions button. So the module buttons are available on the home screen. And as Jonathan also mentioned, you do get everything with the system. So you can switch things off with permissions and also with the administration tools as well. You can access the areas from the links at the top as well. And you've got your more menu to take you into these other areas. Other things to note about the home screen is you can utilise the space. So if you wanted to put any links to resources or some of our customers use this area on the left hand side to promote their daily task list and that kind of thing, you can you can use that. And in addition, we've got the section at the bottom. So this top bit here is our dashboard and I'll come back to that in just a little while. And then because it's our demo system, we've got lots of shortcuts on it to things, but it gives you a little bit of an idea as well as to how you can use this area. So we could put, for example, links to heavily used reports that um, library staff need to, to run regularly. They could just be accessed from the home page. Finally, before I move on, just to highlight to you as well, we've got the online help area here. And um, this is fully context sensitive and it does direct you out into the Koha manual. So because we're at the home page, it takes us to the contents page of the manual. But if we were working within a particular page, it would give us the help file for that page. OK. So I'm going to start by just showing you a wee bit of its flexibility and how things can easily be linked together. So we've got this area up at the top. Now we call this an Omnibox. Um, basic area where you can toggle between different transactions to um, put in your terms. So if I go to search the catalogue, for example, it's asking me to enter search keywords. If I go to issue, it's asking me to put a card number, or partial name in, that sort of thing. And again, that is context sensitive. So for example, if I went into the acquisitions module, it changes and my box becomes a search for vendors and for orders. Okay. I'm just going to show you some navigational links between records. So if I just bring up a test record of mine on the system, 
because I've, I've looked for it by the, the card number, it's pulled through the, it taking me straight into the record. You get your breadcrumb trail along this bar so you can always navigate yourself back. You've got an area at the top where you can go into edit um, records, change passwords, etc. And down at the left hand side, you've got access into a lot of the menu options, very similar to what Lucy said with the OPAC. But before I show you the record linking, I also wanted to just highlight the user messaging preferences area. So this is where you can specify what notices you're going to send from Koha and whether they'll be sent by email. And we do also integrate with SMS gateway providers as well. So you can see in this case, this reserve item available is set to send an SMS to, to me and you know I can get a backup email as well. At the bottom, we've got our individual folders. So we can see, again, as Lucy described, we can see our list of checkouts and charges and reservations and so on. But what I wanted to show as well is the consistency of the um, display within Koha. Areas like this, you get a table format with columns and they've all got column sorters on them. And it may be that, you know, we can see here that the collection tab is mainly blank. So maybe we don't want to see that and you can control which columns are visible on the screen and not just simply by doing that. And that can be set globally through the admin as well, if that's a preference. And because we've got column sorters, we can say, OK, let's see what my checkouts are in title order. And you can just um, toggle these arrows. Now, um, to show you our um, sort of linking between records, so this is a checkout I've got, and the tit title of the item and the barcode are hyperlinks, so I can click on them and it will take me into the catalogue record. Now, the other thing to, to note is that because it's a web based system, there's absolutely no limit to the number of tabs that you can be working with. So that, that can be really beneficial if you're working on a catalogue record you're, and but then you have to go and serve somebody at the issue desk, you can just open a new tab. So we can do a right click, open link in a new tab and it, it goes away and it you know, opens up for you. And from here, I can go back in to my um, catalog, sorry, into my user record if I wanted to. So you can easily see the, the different linking options that are available to you. OK. Um, right, so that was a wee bit about sort of how easy the web navigation is and linking between different records. So I'm now going to take you in to the administration area. And like I said at the start, this is permission controlled, but what, if you've got access into the area, you'll see that it's very well laid out. You've got the system preferences section here, which I'll talk about in a moment. But this is where you would come to define all your configuration. So this is where we would set up our item types and our user categories, our circulation rules, etc. But in addition to that, this is also where you would come in to work with your cataloging templates um, and your your budgets and funds and so on. Now, obviously, I've not got much time, so I'm not going to go into any of these, but I am going to take you into the system preferences area. These are completely searchable and they're grouped together by module. And in Lucy's presentation, she said that it's possible to brand Koha by putting, you know, in any by filling it with content. And I'm just going to touch on some of those bits that she showed. So for quickness, I'm going to search for them, but they are all contained within the OPAC tab here. So the first one I'm going to show is OPAC NAV. And this particular system preference, because it only found, it found the matches, so it gives me that, you know, it searches across the preference name and the descriptions. And this is where Lucy showed, it was on the left-hand side of the OPAC, where she said she could put links out to, to other resources or um, other sites or, or just general information. So it just uses HTML and you just populate it as, as text there. Um, there is, she showed you the My Account. Of course, you don't have to have um, My Account switched on. 
if you want to have it switched on, oh, sorry, wrong one. Well, if, I'll come back to it. If you want to have it switched on, you can then specify what um, text should be seen to assist your user in the login process. So in this case, it's saying to use the 16 um, digit library barcode. But if you don't want to have it switched on, you can simply disable it. So this is one of the on off switches. So it's allow or don't allow. So We've looked at ones that impose HTML, we've looked at ones that you can just put straight text in, and this is a simple switch. Now, Lucy also showed you, she made reference to the QR codes. And again, that's governed by a system preference. So this is where you can say if it's enabled or disabled. So it was highlighted um, by Lucy in the detailed display, but again, it can be switched off if preferred. And one I really quite like, and again, it, it ties in with something that um, Lucy showed. If you recall, she showed the area where you could repeat your search. And she, she said, you know, you could do the search again and it would look in those resources. And this preference here, OPAC no results found, allows you to add some text. So if a user does a search in the catalogue, don't find any hits, you might want to direct them to one of those more searches options because they might just find what they're looking for in there and finally um, in terms of branding and such like you can change colors if you want Co koha uses style sheets so you can use css to change fonts and colors and and you can put logos in place and, and all of that kind of thing and I should also say that the same applies to the staff interface. You can brand it accordingly as well. Some of our customers have both a live and a test server, for example, and change the background colour of their test server so that they, it's clear which one they're working with. Now, in addition to those administration areas, you can also do some work in the tools area. And we can do things like batch item deletions and modifications for, for items, records and users. But another couple of things I just wanted to highlight, we've got our news area, which allows you to put sort of articles and news bulletins and such like on the OPAC and the staff interface. And you can pre-publish, you know, you can pre-populate um, them and publish them at a later date. So that's that's quite a nice feature. But finally, um, in the tools area as well, I just wanted to highlight um, the notices. Now, as I showed you in the user record, you can specify what notices get sent to the users and in what method. And the notices and slips area within the tools allows you to modify the text of these. So if you were sending um, as an overdue, for example, a second overdue, you can edit this and choose the relevant text and select from the database fields. So you can do that with any of them. So just a little bit more, I'm just watching my time. Um, Lucy placed an article request and she placed an interlibrary loan request. So I'm now going to show you the staff's functions of, of those. So I'll start with the article request. Now, down on our homepage in our dashboard area here, we can see that we've got a link to new article requests that are pending. So it's also available within the circulation module. But if I go into it from my dashboard, this brings us through, we can select our library and we can see that it's not the main library. What library were you at, Lucy? <laughs> we'll just check, change it Education. to libraries. Thank you. Oh yeah, my should I think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so there's Lucy's article request that she placed earlier on. And what I would do then is I could come in and, and 
look at it. I can also see that Jonathan placed an article request so I could deal with them at the same time. But if I just look specifically at Lucy's, I've got links into the title, into the user, and from the actions menu, I can then see what I'm doing with it. So I can process the request and that would pop it into the processing tab. So then I would say, go to the shelf, take the journal off the shelf, photocopy it. And then when I was finished, I could complete the request and the user could be notified that it's available for them. That's it. That's that's all you have to do on, in the staff side. And also, on oh, see here as well, the article requests on the dashboard, the, the account has gone down because I've dealt with one. She also placed an interlibrary loan request. And if I come into the ILL area, you can see that the default is to view the, uh, the interlibrary loan request. It tells you how many there are. And again, follows the same pattern as all, all the pages in Koha. You've got the information presented in tables with um, column sorters. You can filter. Um, between dates and such like to, to get a shorter list and you can navigate between your pages. You also have the search bar there. So if I wanted to see specifically what Lucy had um, entered as requests, I can put her name in there and it'll refresh and it's only finding eight. So there's the Lancet, that's the one that she did earlier. So again, I can pick this up as a member of library staff. We can see that this was a new request placed today using the British Library Service. Um, so if I go to manage that request, I then have some options available to me. I can edit the request information here. I could edit the items metadata using this button. I can um, delete the request or, or I can place the request with partners. Now, I, I'll show you this one. Although Lucy selected a British Library request, uh, it is also possible to create interlibrary loans from other partner libraries. So we would just set that up in the configuration. You'd have your partner libraries configured as users. You select which one you want, and then you can um, send them an email asking them for, for that and send the email buttons at the bottom. Um, but if I just go to, to confirm the request, I'm happy with everything that's been put on here. So I confirm the request, it'll update. Because this is a British Library type of request, um, we get some uh, um, information about money owing and so on. We can select what download format we want. Um, so we say we want a 24 hour one and we want it of a standard quality and then we can check the price. OK, so it tells us how much it's going to cost us. And when we place the request, it would, obviously, this is our demo system, so um, it isn't going to send it off, but in theory, it would send it off to the British Library. In the interlibrary loans area now, and also Lucy would see it in her account in the OPAC, that the status would be updated accordingly when it was actually sent off to the British Library. So you can see, for example, this one is one I requested from partners um, the other day. This one's been cancelled. This one's been completed. So the status um, gets updated throughout its journey. So I've shown you some advantages of using the web system. I showed you linking between records and then I, I looked at what Lucy had done and showed you all from the back end as well. I think I'm out of time. Um, I'd love to show you a lot more, but we just don't have the time. Um, but hopefully the quick tour will have highlighted some of the benefits. You can see it's a good fit in your libraries. And obviously, if you would like um, to know more or a detailed demo, then you can just let us know.